It was just a year ago last September that images of the drowned Syrian boy Alan Kurdi shocked the world. It jolted Canadians across the country into action, directly sponsoring thousands of refugees. Such private sponsorship is unique in the world and played a critical part in Canada bringing more than 25,000 Syrian refugees to our shores quickly. Joining us now to examine that system and how well it's working, we're joined in Montreal, Quebec by Janet Dench. She is Executive Director of the Canadian Council for Refugees. And here in our studio, Senator Ratna Omidvar, the former chair of Lifeline Syria, and Ellen Wooliver, Refugee Sponsorship Administrator at the Christie Refugee Welcome Centre. And it's good to welcome all three of you to our program here tonight. Let us start with a quote from a report from the Canadian Council for Refugees. This is Janet Dench's organization, and it goes like this. Unique in the world, Canada's private sponsorship of refugees program has allowed Canadians to offer protection and a new home to more than 275,000 refugees since its beginning in 1979. Despite its historical success, the program has faced dramatic challenges in recent years. The strength of the private sponsorship of refugees program depends on its core principles, additionality and naming. So let's get into this. Janet Dench, what's additionality? Additionality is the principle that uh, the refugees that are sponsored by private sponsors, by, by citizens and, and Canadians, uh, that they are additional to the refugees that the government uh, resettles on behalf of all Canadians. So as Canadians, when we do private sponsorship, we should know that what we're doing is giving a home to an additional number of refugees, not taking on uh, sp sponsorships or resettlement that the government should be doing. Understood. Just before we go to that second principle of naming, let's play a clip of Dr. Martin Mark. He is from the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto. He gave a speech recently in which he discussed this very issue. Sheldon, roll it if you would. Our concern now when we see the 25,000 uh, refugees uh, coming in the guard, the Government Assisted Refugees Program, and we find out that persecuted minorities, Mandians, Shabians, uh, Alawites, uh, Christians are underrepresented, then we feel that we have to be very active, we have to do more, and we have to complement it, ensuring that basically those who need durable solution, they will get it by our, our uh, generosity anyhow. Okay, that's Dr. Martin Mark from the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto. Ellen, let me get to you second on this. How does what he just said there relate to the second issue of naming? Well, naming is uh, really about who gets to choose which refugees get to come. So government-assisted refugees are selected by the UN and uh, recommended to the various governments, and Canada chooses among those. Uh, naming means that in Canada, that what's unique about private sponsorship is that the sponsors themselves can choose who they actually want to bring. So if you have an, a concern with a particular uh, community, such as what Martin Mark was describing there, you can focus your attention on that particular community. And where do they get the names from? Well, uh, in my own experience, it's been family related. So people who come to the uh, Christie Refugee Welcome Center are often family members wanting to sponsor their aunts and uncles and people who uh, would not be eligible under the family class and who are refugees. Are there other names, Senator uh, Omidvar, where they get names from, other yes. places? Yes, uh, my sponsoring team, for example, got its list from the Government of Canada of really high need families which the government could not foreseeably think of taking care of themselves they needed the help of private sponsors so we were given a list of uh, of selected high need families which are typically very large mm. uh, from 8 to 16 uh, a size of family had been in camp like situations for more than 4 years were low literacy and we picked from that list and yes there is an element of playing uh, God in, in, in that, and there was a discomfort I felt, but I was also confident that from that, at that point, it was a list of about 10 families that people were, the private sponsors were really eager to, to pick a family and... So if we, uh, taking, taking account of these two items here, additionality and naming, mm -hmm. how consistent do you think we still are with following those core principles? I think it's a mistake to think about refugees as being in, in just one way. Uh, and, and there's this image we have of refugees 
Uh, but in truth, the refugees are diverse, just as the rest of the world. Some live in camps, some live outside camps, some have small families, some have large families. The beauty of Canada's response is it's, diver it's diverse as well. So there's the government-assisted refugee program, which picks the highest need refugees referred by the UNHCR. Then there's the private sponsorship, and teams like mine can, can do a mix and match. We've got, you know, I mean, we're sort of addicted, sorry, to this. You're sort of addicted? Addicted to doing this. It's really one of the best things I've ever done, and I've done a lot, Steve. But I think about my work I do with my Team Everest, we call it, our, the name of our team is Team Everest. We all agree, this is the best thing we've done. We've got two families, one is extremely high need. One came to us through acquaintances of acquaintances of acquaintances who said, I have a sister and a brother-in-law living in Turkey with two young girls, and the two young girls will never get to university. Will you help us sponsor hmm. them? So we've got a diversity. Can, can I infer from the name of the team that you call it that because trying to achieve this is like calling Climbing the highest mountain in the world? You're absolutely That's right. It. We okay. feel that way. Okay. Uh, Janet Dench, let me go to you on this. I think recently the federal government approached a number of refugee sponsors with a proposal that they swap refugees that they had been planning to bring over and sponsor a different group instead. Do you know why this suggestion would have been made? Well, I think it's a rather particular situation. Of course, what's happened in the last year is really unprecedented. And so there's been a, a certain amount of improvising to try to uh, achieve the very ambitious goals that the, the government set itself. And so part of that was uh, trying to uh, speed things along and, and make uh, matches uh, more quickly than would always happen. And one of the challenges when you're dealing with people who come from a situation of conflict is that uh, there are sometimes cases that need to be studied a bit longer in terms of uh, uh, background checks, for example. And so I think that's part of what happened was that some of the people that had been proposed to sponsorship groups ended up um, not being uh, ready in, in a short amount of time to arrive. And so the government is offering uh, them to, to look at a different family, which obviously puts sponsorship groups in, in a very difficult situation. I right. think everybody can agree. Right. Let me, let me follow. I, I normally love to stay away from acronyms on this program, but this one, BVOR, Blended Visa Office Referred. That's a program. What is that? Uh, the blended visa office referred is a, a sort of a subset of the visa office referred, which is really what Ratna was talking about in terms of um, refugees that have been identified by the government. So the government uh, has um, gets referrals from the UNHCR, which is best placed to say, okay, these are the people that we've identified as being uh, in need of resettlement, particularly vulnerable. And so those names come forward, and uh, so they can be proposed to uh, sponsorship groups in Canada who uh, are interested in getting referrals. Either they don't know who, who else to, to bring, or they want somebody that is particularly identified as being among the most vulnerable. The blended part of it is to say that it's partly government assisted and partly privately sponsored. So the government is going to cover the costs uh, for half of the year and the private sponsors for the other half while they're also responsible for supporting them for the whole year. So it's a sort of somewhere in between, between the government and the private sponsorship. And, and from our perspective, that's where the, the issue of additionality, uh, we start to get nervous and we were uh, disappointed that the government this year decided to count uh, the blended visa office referred refugees as Syrians, even though uh, they're counting them as government assisted ones towards the, the government's targets, even though in fact private sponsors are taking on half of the responsibility. Well, you've anticipated my next question, Ellen, let me put it to you, which is, is there anything inconsistent about this BVOR blended visa office referred program and what's happening right now? And the original, and you know, and the two original um, principles upon which the refugee program is designed. Well, as Janet just said, there's there's a bit of a controversy within the community right. about how do you count, and um, once you get into refugee sponsorship, uh, um, you realize that from the government's point of view, counting is important. You know. Uh, it all adds up to money in the end and what you can do and what you can't do. So And fulfilling campaign promises made and this type of thing. Exactly, right. So our, our understanding within the sponsorship community is that for this year, they decided to count the BVORs among the government assisted as they try very hard to make that number add up to 25,000 by the end of 2016. You so want to get in on this? I, uh, I want to get in on this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, it's fair to recognize that the BVOR cases uh, should be counted only at the maximum at half, because it is half a 
public commitment and mm -hmm. have a private commitment. Yeah. But I want to underline that this is a wonderful public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, we would never have found this family without the help of the government. The government would never have been able to bring them over without us. And here are 12 people who lived in a camp, eight children between the ages of three to 16. The 16-year-old mm -hmm. boy reads at grade two level. If that's not high need, I don't know what is. Gotcha. Can I, let me read something uh, else to you, Senator. Um, this is from the cbc.ca website. Uh, last February, some criticisms coming to light regarding an email from the ministry responsible for refugees and it read as follows. I am asking that the sponsorship agreement holder community delay sponsorship application submissions in 2016 until planning for the immigration levels plan is finalized. During this period, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada will continue to accept applications submitted for Syrian refugees. And then the reportage goes on to say, only 35 private sponsorship applications were received for all non-Syrian refugees in January 2016, compared to a monthly average of 387, in other words, more than 10 times as many, in 2015. Have the criticisms from groups wanting to sponsor non-Syrians been adequately dealt with at this point in your judgment? I don't think they've been adequately dealt with. When you look at the processing times from other visa, uh, uh, visa offices mm -hmm. uh, in high need refugee uh, producing countries or jurisdictions, one has to sort of understand that our resources were shifted uh, to meet the demand in Syria. Were we, were we ill advised to do that? I, I think it was an appropriate response to some extent. It was the largest humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. after the Second World War. We had to take some emergency measures. But you know what it also meant, though. But it also meant, I think now the time has maybe come for us to have a two-pronged, to think about a two-pronged mm -hmm. response. We must always be ready to launch an emergency response because emergencies are always going to happen. The way of the world tells us this. But at the same time, we must have a stability of infrastructure that continues to respond to other. I mean, I've, I, I've, I get emails from people in the South Sudan, from Kampala, and these emails are heart rending. And I say, we played God, literally, yes. in picking that family over and over. It makes me feel inherently uncomfortable. And I would be much more comfortable as a Canadian uh, if I knew that my government was A, doing emergency response on the one hand, but also managing the demand in a reasonable, timely manner in other jurisdictions. Well, let's talk about the government's point man on all this, because I think it was 10 or 11 months ago we had the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, John McCallum, uh, MP from York Region, on the program to talk about the delays that Iraqi Christian refugees were facing because Syrians were getting government priority, as you point out, for perfectly understandable reasons. Let's play a snippet of that conversation, then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. You feel bad about others who are having to wait longer because well, of this? Well, I have asked questions about that, and I was assured by my department that none of the others are adversely affected. They're not... Well, I'm hearing different. Okay, I'm told that the resources diverted to help the Syrians were not diverted from other refugees. So the other refugees are probably going slower than we would like, but they're not going slower as a consequence of Syria. That's what I've been told. And I don't really apologize for putting the focus on Syria because this is the worst refugee crisis the world has seen in decades. And Canada can't be a home to everybody, and there's nothing wrong with focusing on the worst crisis Janet, it sounded as if the minister was saying we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can prioritize the Syrians who are in desperate need uh, to get out of their horrendous situation, while at the same time we can also deal with Iraqi Christians and others who find themselves in similar circumstances. Uh, but the facts, I think, suggest otherwise. You know, if you weren't Syrian, you had a harder time here. Uh, is that your understanding of things? Well, I think it's also important to look at the broader context, which is that there has been very different uh, realities depending on the region that you're coming from. And uh, refugees from Africa have been having a really hard time getting to Canada. So there's been very long delays. Uh, the situation this year with the focus on Syria uh, doesn't uh, help, uh, but it also is not itself in itself uh, responsible for the fact that people have been waiting five or more years in many cases uh, for their processing to happen. 
I, I do give credit to the government uh, that has recognized the need to respond to other refugee populations. I, I know that it is part of their consideration, but from our perspective, uh, there needs to be a higher priority uh, given to resolving these issues and, and to be seen to be resolving them too. The, the, the government has put a lot of emphasis into promoting Syrian refugees and that is terrific, but it means that a lot of people across Canada, uh, they think only Syrian when they think of refugees. And mm -hmm. so we would like to see the government take action, but also speak out about why it's important for us as Canadians to be responding to other refugee situations. Ellen, I think at one point the ministry basically suggested stop submitting applications for non-Syrians that is, uh, you know, they may not have wanted to, but they saw it as a reasonable request given the inundation of Syrian uh, cases that they needed to get through. Do you think that was a reasonable response by the ministry? Well, there's a lot of technicalities in this world, and that request was actually based on the... Um, I understand that the levels of the people they want to sponsor in the following years are supposed to be uh, submitted by November, but because of the election, that didn't happen. At the same time, because of the big Syrian movement, you know, that was to carry on while we waited. And it wasn't the first year we've been asked to wait until uh, our allocations had been given out. Hmm. So I, Reasonable I, request? Uh, I think, well, the response of the sponsorship community is interesting. As you pointed out, only 35, you know, it was left up to the sponsors. Um, you, you can go ahead and submit if you want, but we ask you not to except for Syrians and as you said only 35 applications right. went in during that time. However, it is important to say that this is a, a mammoth year for sponsorship and... Uh, it's a mammoth year for refugees. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking in the lobby earlier, 44,000 landings this year. Hmm. That's, That's almost twice, Steve. Yeah. And, and yes, we can't take every refugee in the, in the world. Other nations must step up to the plate, absolutely. Uh, but it is a moment, I think, quite like the 1980s when we welcomed the Indo-Chinese refugees. It's been an enormous nation-building movement, partly uh, because of private sponsors, because for the first time after, I think, 20 years, unusual groups step forward. So dog walking clubs and mm -hmm. film groups and moms and tots groups and university presidents. And everybody said, I want a sponsor. Yeah. It was like a positive infection. It's wonderful. A positive infection. Action. Yes. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. Okay. Let's, uh, Sheldon, can we go to uh, chapter four here? Let's put this chart up. Uh, we've got it, you two in the studio, just look at the monitors here. We have a chart which shows that the number of applications to sponsor refugees, that's the blue line. The blue line sort of in the middle there. Uh, usually exceeds the number of refugee applications that are finalized, thus leading to an ever-growing backlog. And I want to know, uh, let's, Janet, let's start with you on this one. Um, what do we do about this? Well, it's a question of the will of the government. How much space do you want to give to private sponsorship? And in the last few years, as you point out, the number of refugees that they've been willing to bring in each year has been le less than the number of uh, sponsorship applications that are going in. So obviously that leads to an ever-growing backlog. Uh, wonderful thing this year, of course, is that the level for privately sponsored refugees has gone up very dramatically, and, and that has had benefit for other groups as well as Syrian refugees. Uh, but a critical question is going to be what will happen next year and in the following year. So we're all waiting next uh, week. Uh, the government will be tabling uh, the levels uh, for the next, uh, next year and maybe the next three years. So we'll be looking very closely to see uh, are the levels for private sponsorship going to be high enough so that that backlog can be uh, absorbed in, in a very short space of time. Hmm. Senator, do we know if the backlog is on our end processing or in the country of origin? Do we have any idea which it is? I believe the backlog is on the other end, the delays in uh, getting people to interviews, to getting them screened, to getting them uh, security screen, the medical exam, getting them on the IOM flights. This is a time frame that continues to uh, sort of lag out. And ultimately, it's a question of people on the ground. How mm -hmm. many people is Canada willing to commit to processing on the ground? And it's a direct function of A equals B. So if we had more people on the ground, we'd get processing more faster. Mm. Ellen, anything to add to that? No, I think that um, 
the complaints you hear, you know, for people who have decided that they are interested in sponsorship, you know, they've been infected. Uh, positively infected. Positively <laughs> infected. You know, they're saying, well, why can't, you know, we did it for the Syrians, why can't mm, we do yes. it for everybody else? I mean, if you have this amazing political will to send jets over to collect 25,000 people, you can do a lot. Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, Janet, an, uh, again from your organization, a map here. And Sheldon, maybe we could bring this up right now. This is from the Canadian Council of Refugees, and it's from that report we cited off the top of the program, which shows that countries that are covered by capped visa offices. Um, let's start with, uh, Janet, first of all, just what that means. So in 2012, the government started uh, um, putting a number of visa offices under this cap, which means that sponsorship agreement holders uh, have a very limited number of spots uh, for putting in new applications. And these were uh, visa offices which, depending upon your point of view, either the sponsors were putting too many applications in or, from the other point of view, the government was not so keen on having uh, refugees uh, process through those visa offices uh, uh, submitted. And so it, it means that if you are uh, looking for somebody to sponsor a refugee uh, that is in one of those areas, it's very difficult to find a private sponsor who has a space available. Is that why the caps were put on in the first place? So the caps are, as I say, they're really, I mean, they're, they correspond also to the backlog. So the, the idea was that, okay, well, we've got a big backlog here. We'll, we'll stop people putting in new applications uh, and then we'll process the old ones and we'll be able to bring the processing times down, down for those visa offices. But it, it really hasn't worked because uh, even though the number of applications you can put in has uh, been very restricted, uh, it nevertheless remains that those visa offices, particularly in Nairobi, which has a huge backlog, uh, that they, those remain uh, very uh, visa offices with very, very long processing times and, and large backlogs. Sheldon, maybe uh, so we that's can... uh, one of the real challenges, and, and it's one of the reasons why we're in a kind of uh, a completely impossible situation where we want to encourage people to look at refugees from other parts of the world, but when it comes to it, if you say, okay, well, we, why don't you take a, a yeah. try for an Eritrean family, well, you look at the visa offices and you say, well, sorry, we can't sponsor them because there's a cap on the numbers uh, that can come out of that region. And furthermore, uh, we look at the processing times and we see that it's gonna take six, seven years before they arrive. And so, of course, that's uh, no, that's gonna be a total uh, discouragement for any uh, sponsorship group to take hmm. it on. Sheldon, let's just flip the map up one more time uh, rather quickly. Does it, in your view, Ellen, still make sense to have these visa caps put on place in these countries? Well, it's, it's a matter of doing the math. You know, if you, the, the backlogs is what leads to it taking four, five, six, seven years for people to come, which is, is really not acceptable for a refugee situation. Right. Um, and so the idea of putting on a cap is to bring down those backlogs to try to get to, I, I guess their ideal is an 18 month processing time. Does that ever get hit? Uh, ever hit 18 months? It, yeah, the claim is that they're gonna get close to it in the next year or so, but uh, so it means bringing more people here more quickly. Mm -hmm. And that is happening this year, but we'll see. Okay. With, yeah. Let me follow up with you on this. Um, September this year, Canada signs an agreement at the UN to help other countries implement private refugee sponsorship programs, the likes of which we have here. What do you think of that move? It's, I think it's a great move. I think that the program in Canada has certainly um, enabled the government to do more than it could have done, and, and it seems like something that the rest of the world could benefit from. Senator George Soros is involved in that. Yeah. George Soros's name is always wrapped up in controversy, and there's controversy here too. Any issues that you're concerned about? Well, George Soros is a controversial pro-democracy pro entrepreneur, and he puts his money where his mouth is. He does. Uh, before I became a senator, I had the good fortune, really, to work for about eight years with his foundation, the Open Societies Institute. They mm -hmm. do cutting-edge research because he believes very much in open societies that are inclusive. Now, his funding of this idea, uh, and, and you know, I think it's $5 million or so to bring it to other nations, is a, is a very uh, typical response from an entre entrepreneur who wants to take a good idea and export it to other places. And I think Ellen is absolutely right. This is something Canada has done that no other jurisdiction has done. Now they're beginning to. We've got about 13 countries following our lead. But 
I would urge Mr. Soros, if he ever wonders to listen to, to me or to us, is to keep that principle of additionality in mind. I would not want uh, private sponsors and the privatization, let's say, of refugees uh, uh, processing uh, to let governments off the hook. Um, we had a big uh, summit in New York last month at the UNHCR where nation after nation stood up and said, we will do this, we will do so much. I would not want that commitment, that is a, 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 a commitment of, of the state, to, to, to be chipped away at by, by pri private responses. It has to be additional to what they do. Understood. Let us, you know, we get a lot of questions here all the time from members of the public. Mm -hmm. Some of the basic nuts and bolts of this thing. Uh, Janet, let me go to you first on this. Once a refugee is approved to come to Canada, who pays for the costs of resettling them here? Travel well, expenses, the, let's start with that. Yes, well, the, the um, cost of the uh, medical exam that they need to do to satisfy uh, Canada that their health is okay, as well as their transportation to Canada is uh, has to be paid for by the refugee. And of course, they don't generally have the money to pay for it up front. So what they do is they sign an agreement, uh, often not really knowing what they're doing, but uh, before they are, uh, leave, to say that they will uh, pay the government back after they arrive. And so um, shortly after they arrive, they uh, receive something in the mail saying uh, that this is how much you need to pay uh, the government back uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, it's uh, a, a limit of $10,000 uh, per family. Uh, but it's uh, a huge burden uh, for people who start off. Um, and we heard about you know, some of the situations of people who are in very vulnerable situations. Uh, you can barely survive. You're getting a minimum uh, amount of income, uh, social assistance uh, rates, or maybe you've got a minimum wage job, and yet you've got to be paying this monthly um, uh, this, uh, monthly payment to the government, uh, which is the repayment plus interest uh, for the transportation hmm. costs. How often so that, are those? That's a, that's a big, uh, it has a yeah. big impact on right. people psychologically and, and just in their choices of how they, they try to survive. Uh, we should add that the transportation costs and the medical exam costs for Syrian refugees have been waived by the government. Uh, for, so for some of them. There are some Syrians that have not had it covered. Depends from which jurisdiction. But the point is uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm fully in favor on you know, recovery of fees and user fees. But for ref and, and you know, we do that in citizenship. We charge a fee for uh, when you want to become a citizen. The fee is quite high in the meantime mm -hmm. because it's full cost recovery. Maybe that's the way it should be. Uh, but for refugees, I, I cannot understand uh, that we are being compassionate on the one hand and being transactional on the other. Uh, I, I find those two uh, sort of uh, ideas contradictory. I would prefer us to be fully generous to refugees. So waive that fee entirely. Waive that fee. Leave it up to them once they've settled um, and ask them, when do you think you are ready to give back something? Mm -hmm. I know, I mean, and, and we all know here how difficult it is for refugees mm -hmm. to find work, to integrate into the community, to have this, uh, these, this threat of repayment hanging over your head. And, and in many jurisdictions, for many countries, having a loan and being indebted is, is, is a, it, it's a very, very mm -hmm. difficult thing to cope with. So I would say, let's find money elsewhere, maybe elsewhere even in the immigration system. There are immigrants who can afford to pay for what they get, but let's, let's be fully compassionate for refugees. Jenna, what happens if they can't pay the money back? Well, they um, will often be harassed by uh, collection uh, officers who, who try to get the money off them. Uh, eventually, um, in, in some cases, of course, it's uh, declared non-payable. Uh, but it also has impacts, for example, if you want to sponsor another family member and you haven't finished, uh, uh, you're behind on your uh, payments there, you won't be able to do that. Um, so it can have uh, consequences for people if they don't manage to, to pay up. Hmm. Should, Ellen, should we have a blanket waiving of any fees for refugees coming to this country? Certainly, I think the medical and the transportation fees should be waived. It's just so counterproductive. You know, they're working so hard to settle, and, you know, we have a settlement, we have settlement agencies to help people integrate. It makes no sense to arrive here with, with a bill. 
<laughs> and if, if, if it becomes a real sort of uh, stumbling block, uh, maybe we ask private sponsors. To pick up that To fee. pick up some, you know, and I certainly know from the many private sponsors I hang out with uh, that they are, uh, that they would be open to doing that. Not they're, all, but some. I was going to say, they're already picking up a lot of fees, right? I mean, renting apartments and yeah. other settlement-oriented yeah. costs. You and you see me smiling. I see you smiling, but you think they'd be up for 10000 more in costs and uh, health it, and travel expenses? I think it depends. Yeah. I think it depends. It's not, not a bad idea to ask. <laughs> you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. That's what they say. Well, some of the private sponsors already do, yes. do pay that because it's so terrible for them to watch uh, yeah. their, the people they're sponsoring right. uh, hmm. break down on the burden of this. Uh, but uh, it's also, we need to remember the government-assisted refugees that don't have a private sponsor, so often they are among uh, the most vulnerable, so it, it is particularly harsh for them to be facing that burden. should mention that the government has already committed to pay the uh, medicals starting next April, um, the medical exams, but that's the smaller part of the, the, uh, the amount of money that people have to pay, so it's not a, a major solution. Gotcha. Got just a couple of minutes left here, and I guess I, I just want to go around our literal and metaphorical table here and find out what you three believe to be the most pressing issue that you think the government needs to address as it relates to this private sponsorship program and the way it currently stands. Ellen, why don't you start us? Um, I, seeing what, what happened after the picture of Alan Curdy and seeing how much interest there is and how much generosity there is, I think the most pressing issue perhaps is to um, figure where it does that grassroots interest come from and how do we nurture that and, and how do we make that work for more people. Janet Dench, how about you? I would say to give the priority to uh, clearing out all of the backlogs and, and making sure that uh, there can be equitable treatment of refugees uh, in a timely way from all parts of the world. In your view, does the government seem committed to doing just that? We know that there's a, a goal to, to get rid of the, the backlogs. Um, whether that's going to be achieved, uh, that's, uh, we're all watching carefully for that. Nice diplomatic answer. Okay, Senator Omidvar, what do you think? I, I couldn't say anything wiser than what Janet has said. Uh, hmm. Backlog, I, I know that private sponsors are a high demand. They, they are vocal. Uh, they're very upset that they've raised the money, they've rented apartments, they've Skyped with the kids, they've got the baseball hats mm. all lined up. They've made and, that connection. And made that connection. They're emotionally committed, mm. and they're sitting back and waiting, and they're not happy. So I yeah. would say if the government wants to rely on private sponsors in the future, then it needs to clear the backlog and, and, and make these private sponsors feel uh, you know, valued in that way. They're very uh, upset right now. I you're, would say. you're a senator. I mean, you yes. can go right to John McCallum and, and make that case. I am going to Mr. <laughs> to the minister and making that case. But I think uh, there are bigger issues at play. Uh, Janet was again completely right. What's what's really at the heart of all of this is the numbers. Mm. We we have to get the levels discussion, and I'm hoping it's not going to be a levels discussion that is based on one year. It's that's that's insane to make such big big plans for one year. We have to do them three years at a time. There has to be some flexibility within each class this year, maybe more refugees, less of this, more of that. But it is the numbers that define how this game gets played. And so we're all waiting anxiously for what happens next week. And we'll keep watching. I want to thank all of you for coming on TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Janet Dench from the Canadian Council for Refugees on the Line in Montreal, Quebec. Senator Ratna Omidvar, the former chair of Lifeline Syria, and Ellen Williver. Refugee Sponsorship Administrator with the Christie Refugee Welcome Center. Good to have both of you here in our studio as well. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.